for lunch, so hopefully <laughs> I'll, make, I'll manage to keep you awake uh, while you are digesting your nice meal. So my name is Ryan Gashich. I'm a professor and chair in learning analytics and informatics at the University of Edinburgh, which is in Scotland. Obviously, I don't have any Scottish accent. I can try to pretend to put some uh, on, but uh, I'm going to talk about learning analytics today. And my particular focus will be on um, strategic adoption of learning analytics in higher education, and also the kind of policies that are related uh, that enable for adoption of learning analytics. I made this kind of uh, today's session or the talk more kind of suited in such a way that uh, uh, is uh, accessible for a broader audience in a way that I'm going to first briefly introduce what I mean by learning analytics and then uh, identify certain challenges that we so far observed in kind of systemic adoption of learning uh, analytics and then discuss about some potential directions. Everything is done in the scope of uh, European project uh, that is called Sheila. So if you just Google sheilaproject.eu, you will be able to find details about the project. And in that project, we are trying to support higher education institutions in integrating learning analytics, and that's the acronym Sheila as well, where it comes from. So as I said, uh, I'm gonna start first of all with kind of brief introduction, what I mean with learning analytics, and I'm gonna probably repeat some of that tomorrow as well, because you never know, I mean, these days what people mean or whether they are familiar at all with learning analytics. And in terms of broader context, why we are talking about learning analytics at all, I mean, uh, most of you are quite familiar with the growing needs for education, which is not necessarily just in terms of opening access to our higher education institutions from kind of high schools, but also opening education to even lifelong. And we saw that with MOOCs as well, that there's a really kind of a completely underserved population of out there professionals who already had degrees that needed additional types of uh, education. At the same time, we are also kind of seeing a big push in universities to promote teaching excellence, to promote more active learning methodologies. Everybody's trying to improve their classrooms, to do all sorts of things to make their students more engaged. But it's also a general trend in many cases that we are uh, across the board in terms of government funding generously being defunded. And so we are expected to educate more for uh, with better learning experience for less funding. In many cases, to address that kind of need, we are turning to technology. And turning to technology to kind of provide personalized learning, but in many cases, also introduction of that technology. And also, when you're talking about scaling up education, is also reducing the opportunities for any kind of feedback loops that are existing in face-to-face -face interaction, interaction between people, where some of these social cues are uh, potentially completely diminished. And we frequently don't even know uh, what are the reasons and what other people who are in the process uh, doing or not. This is the place where we see the use of uh, learning analytics and how learning analytics of the field start emerging. What we are kind of uh, positioning and how learning analytics can be illustrated as kind of a typical configuration in higher education is that almost every institution has some sort of learning environment. In many cases, those are the LMSs. Most of the universities in the world have a single LMS, like that would be like Blackboard or Canvas or whatever. I come from an institution where we have nine. Anyway, the solution for us is, oh, this is like, this, our current LMS doesn't work, and they are reviewing it, they are trying to replace it. And then we have a different approach. Let's use another one as well. No, I don't think that's the strategic approach, but that's really kind of cultural. Thing. The other thing that is also available in most of the institutions is the student information system. That's where the place where we have student records, right? That's been something uh, that every university or higher education had since its inception, even before digital technologies. That's something where we are keeping uh, track of the student trades. That's the place where we are uh, holding all sorts of socio demographic and economic uh, variables and data about our students. In many cases, also, we are trying to use a wide range of different technologies, whether we are talking about different types of social media to promote digital identity or establish the ways how to leverage the masses to um, kind of find information or to develop practitioners, uh, reflective practitioners to use of different types of logging technologies or improve different types of information skills. Seeking skills leverage multimedia and so on. One critical thing is that whatever we are doing with these online technologies is we are always living a digital footprint. And that's really a reality since we had the web. Uh, in early days, these digital footprints were created for the purposes of software engineers making sure 
that certain services that were provided online were working. But over time, you realize that these digital footprints can also be used for analysis by using different techniques that are coming from statistics, machine learning, data mining, social network analysis, text analysis, etc., for the purposes of both understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which learning occurs. So that's really one critical thing. How that basically analysis is done, then we are then uh, trying to interpret the findings with respect to the literature that comes from educational psychology, sociology, the general education, and in many cases, even economics and other related fields. And the final purpose of learning analytics is eventually to try to provide some sort of feedback back to the main stakeholders. We are talking about educators and learners, but in many cases, we also find that some upper levels of analytics that are typically labeled as academic analytics are also trying to cater to administrators, the senior university leaders, but in some cases also government, government officials, and so on. So this is really in a nutshell what we mean uh, by learning analytics. What are some of the common examples that are available? One example that I don't like to be called learning analytics, it's labeled anyway as uh, academic analytics. It was developed at Purdue University. Uh, at their uh, engineering faculty had a challenge of students dropping out. And they wanted to early in their courses uh, uh, to kind of predict which of these students would be at risk of failing a course. So they had a precise same type of configuration that I just mentioned. So they had the LMS, in their case it was Blackboard, and they also see an external information system. And then they decide to use the variables out of those two systems to uh, make a prediction whether student was at risk or not. And they actually decide to have three uh, kind of levels of risk high risk, moderate risk, or no risk at all. Then they translated these three levels of risk into traffic lights that were presented back to both students and teachers as the indicators whether students were at risk or not, thus, the uh, course signals. So they were following a cohort of students for a period of uh, four years, between 2007 and 11. And in that period of time, uh, they basically were observing how students who took at least one course with course signals performed versus those who never took a course with course signals. And so these are some of the findings in terms of the gains with respect to uh, course signals. And the cohort of students who took at least uh, one course with course signals had an average on every given year about 10 to 15, in some cases almost 20 percent higher retention rate. So this is quite promising in terms of the kind of success and everything. I'm going to tomorrow discuss some of the uh, kind of darker sides of this finding and the study and some of the debates that were available in the literature related to this example. But then there's another critical challenge as well. Is while many people were quite excited to use the predictions of risk, learning analytics is not about deficit models. It is not just about trying to identify students who are at risk of failing and then just labeling them you are basically uh, labeled it as a risk, and we are actually trying to help you. Where we are seeing more work that is happening uh, recently, learning analysis focus on understanding of learning strategies, understanding of different types of 21st century skills people are uh, using, and also understanding of the types of things that are related to improved feedback and the ways how we can better teach in many cases. So the question that became uh, relevant is, that can teaching really be improved with learning analytics as well. There was a study as a follow-up of the work on course signals in which they were trying to understand how teachers interacted to their students as a consequence of the introduction of course signals. What they decided to do in their study were basically going into the messages that uh, teachers were sending to their students, and they were looking at the quantity of these messages and the quality. What they found was that the quantity rapidly decreased as a consequence of the course signals. However, the quality of these messages was not ideal, meaning that in most of the cases they were just saying motivational message, but really without much instruction, and telling students how and in what ways they could improve where they were in terms of basically them being at risk. So this basically had two critical things. One is that while the metaphor uh, was relevant in terms of the simplicity, like 
traffic lights to communicate to different stakeholders. Obviously, it didn't offer much in terms of the insight to provide the reasons why students were addressed, and also consequently to provide some guidance to the teaching staff how they can intervene more effectively. That was the first thing. And the second thing is that just the, the, the act of introducing the assistant doesn't mean that your teaching staff or your stakeholders know how to effectively utilize that system. Therefore, you need to provide also additional type of training opportunities that can help them to utilize that opportunity much more effectively. So, there was another uh, approach which I think was much more comprehensive in terms of the use of learning analytics, and that was developers in Michigan in their case. They're not really interested in students at risk, but they don't have that kind of a problem. Their retention rate, rate is about 94 or 95%, and they are frequently saying even between those 5 or 6% who leave the University of Michigan, many of them are transfer students to Stanford or Harvard. So they are not really students at risk. So in their case, they identified a different problem. And what, there was a problem for students for whom science was not a major, they were still asked to take a science course or several science credits in year one. And they basically identified these like big gateway courses in year one at Michigan science courses where some of these students for whom science was not a major would be slightly intimidated when they were supposed to take some of these courses. And then in many cases their goal would be to kind of get a lower grade than usually they would get in their home disciplines. So then they wanted to uh, kind of have a comprehensive approach in such a way that the outcome would be a better improvement of student success. And their measure was better than expected with respect to students' uh, own expectations uh, that they set in part of the goals. So that meant really that they were asking students to tell them what was the goal inside of a particular course they wanted to take. That was the first thing. And that before that, asking students to set the goals and everything, they also did a fairly kind of broad qualitative type of a study in which they uh, went on and asked the students who were in similar shoes, uh, wearing similar shoes uh, the previous years who were successful, asking them what kind of strategies they were using. And something also I believe Joseph was uh, this morning kind of uh, discussing as well whether students would trust more teachers or uh, students. Uh, they were also uh, building on the uh, public health literature as well. They basically found that people are much more inclined to accept advice from their peers rather than from experts. And similarly, they also did it here with course signals. So when students would be receiving feedback, they would be not only kind of uh, signed by, the feedback would not be just signed by the teachers, but rather they would be also a reference to their colleagues from the previous years their names of the previous year's colleagues would be made as well. Even very frequently, their photos would be included, and then their advice. So they tried to kind of connect it with the reality of some of these similar other students who were sharing similar types of problems in the past. So also these messages would have additional motivational components, which would be built on something which is called self-determination theory, trying to provide students with the rationale why, for example, studying chemistry was relevant for a sociology student. Then also they were trying to use a fairly empathetic language in such a way that you tell them, well, we understand this would be slightly intimidating, however, these type of efforts can also uh, uh, go a long way in terms of improvement and the things that are relevant for your success. And then, based on that, they would then outline the learning uh, plan for them in terms of the kind of strategies they, they could follow. They've been using now each coach for several several years, and they are reporting about half a letter grade to increase in student success for students who are taking courses with uh, course signals. So it's a quite considerable action improvement, considering that uh, letter grade is about uh, one letter grade is about ten uh, percent, so half a letter grade would be five percent. So these are some really interesting uh, examples that are showing some promise of the use of learning analytics. More recently, we are also focusing on something that is trying to generate kind of a personalized, completely feedback, and it's a technology which we call uh, on task. And in the on task environment, we are trying to provide students with a fairly personalized messages where we are trying to empower teachers to uh, reach out to their students. We are in particular thinking about the ways how uh, teaching staff 
can use certain indicators that are coming from the environment related to the tasks that students need to do in a given week. For example, they have to solve certain problems, they need to engage in different types of uh, formative uh, learning or formative quizzes that are available in the environment. They also need to uh, watch or use certain types of materials that are provided in the environment. So what we decide to do is to develop a fairly low-tech technology that you can actually download data fairly uh, easily, and then think in terms of the tasks and map these indicators of the tasks. In our case, we were just thinking for each task, we may divide students just into four tasks. That's one way to think about the problem. But the, the platform actually is much more creative. So for each of these then tasks, uh, or four tasks, the instructor would provide certain type of snippet of feedback, right? This would be the first thing. So say students would have in a given week five tasks, so the, the instructor would need to fill uh, five such uh, matrices, as I'm talking uh, now. Then the next step would be the algorithm would take these snippets for every student based on the position where they were, and then try to combine. So if a student would watch out one task one, they would get a certain snippet, report out two, certain snippet, and so on. So the consequence of that was that, for example, in a classroom where we had about 450 students in every given week who would generate about 300 unique messages for students. So fairly personalized messages that were kind of of this shape. So we were getting basically something that was presented to the students with a fairly kind of clear indication with respect to particular types of tasks that they had in every week with a certain guidance that the instructor tailored. So in terms of the workload, you can think of basically uh, support for students in, in terms of the numbers of three to four, whereas we are talking about supporting hundreds of students. So the workload of instructors really was very scalable and not dependent on the number of students, but rather on the number of tasks that we are interested in. So what was the consequence of the use of the system is basically, first of all, uh, students really most of universities that is recently don't necessarily appreciate the type of feedback that they get. So I come from an institution which is frequently ranked top 20 in most of research rankings, yet when it comes down to our national survey, student survey, in the UK we are at the bottom four ten. And particularly students aren't happy with feedback that they are receiving. So what we basically got here is we were following students three years and we had that also for the course for many years before. That were always in this range 3.2 to 3.3 in terms of students' happiness with the feedback and how they perceived. Interesting thing uh, was that in 2014 we introduced dashboards. Students couldn't care less about those dashboards. They didn't really see them as feedback. They were slightly using them, but they really didn't pay much attention. Uh, when we introduced this intervention that I just had explained, and we administered these uh, weekly messages with students for only four weeks. We went basically went for half a standard deviation, so went about from 3.3 to 3.85. The other interesting thing was that students were also replying back in many cases and thinking it was a call for them to engage further with their instructors. And instructors would also get a sense of what their students wanted, and then they redesigned the ways how they were engaging students in their classes. So it was another interesting thing that was a consequence. We also had a slight improve in terms of student performance. However, we didn't have all the relevant covariates that I wanted to have inside of the, our models. That are, so I don't want to really kind of make any kind of claims with respect to the improvements in terms of uh, gains. But really, this is some very interesting things. More importantly to me, when we analyze a lot of that, not only in terms of the students being happier with the feedback, we also found that students were Returning back to the uh, advice and the goals that were set for particular lessons, so learning outcomes and learning objectives. So they were exploring more, and they were also utilizing even more the dashboard itself. So this feedback actually encouraged them to engage in some of these metacognitive types of activities that they were collecting. So there were some extra benefits. So as you can see, I mean, you can do many things with learning analytics in a fairly inexpensive way without really going uh, to invest much uh, into development of very fancy technologies. But then the question really is, when I said this old thing showing up on the screen, can I just get rid of that video? I'll do it at some point. Sure, no problem. Just hide. Oh, perfect. Yeah. 
so what is the really kind of the institutional state of adoption? Obviously, everything is shiny with learning analytics, so I'm sure then everybody should use it, right? So we've been studying that problem uh, inside of two different projects. One project which was uh, finished, and we did, it, we did it in Australia, in which we tried to benchmark the entire Australian higher ed sector. They have 40 public universities. We talked to four, uh, 32 of them out there. They could want to talk to us. And then we are now running a European project, which I previously mentioned, which is called Sheila. And Sheila, uh, we basically also engaged in Europe only over 50 universities. We talked to their senior leaders. We also talked to students. We also talked to teaching staff. And we also talked to experts. Plus, of course, we analyzed the literature. So what is basically the case is that there are very few institutions that they have uh, institution-wide adoption of learning analytics. So there are some really interesting examples, like you know, Michigan, or, for example, Purdue University, but that's typically used in a kind of a smaller pocket of the university. Even if it's used in a smaller pocket of university, uh, an exceptional example is the University of Michigan, because they also have the whole strategy of how to promote learning analytics and how to scale up some of that innovation. However, in many other institutions, that's not the case. So what are some of these critical challenges that we identified as part of the processes? We first of all observed that there are really very limited uh, opportunities for staff inside of institutions to develop their skills, how to effectively use learning analytics in their uh, teaching. I'm going to also reflect a little bit later on this once we start talking about some directions how learning analytics can be adopted and some of the expectations of different stakeholders in the process. In many cases, what we found is that many institutional leaders thought once they bought a beautiful product, that product will do the magic. They didn't have to do, they didn't have to worry at all. And it was literally the case that we found basically in one of the institutions. Yeah, we bought this product, learning analytics box date. So we basically solved that problem. So, and that basically also tells us another critical thing about the leadership. Who's the leader inside a university who's actually setting the tone? We talked to many organizations that are at the kind of edge of providing learning analytics services. And they tell us there's huge overwhelming interest in the US. But when it comes down to talking to institutional leaders, they are kind of very eager, yet they have no clue what to do with learning analytics. And also what it entails to use learning analytics inside of an institution in terms of the capacity for the institution to embrace it. So the other thing as well, what happens in many cases, there is no equal engagement of all the relevant stakeholders. Students are hardly ever asked what they think about some of the analytics. And when they are asked, their kind of feedback is quite contrary to some of the, our expectations or some of the mainstream activities. I'm going to touch on that as well a bit later. Faculty members rarely ever in, in kind of engaged as well in the process. In many cases, we are seeing very kind of uh, frequent and dominant kind of top-down approach where we have a beautiful system hanging somewhere there nobody uses. So there's another critical thing that is a big blocker for many institutions, the lack of policies. And the question is related to, for example, uh, opt-in or opt-out, whether we have student informed consent or not, whether something is ethical to do or is not ethical. Joseph this morning talked about many kind of ethical dilemmas. Learning analytics kind of brings many of these interesting ethical dilemmas. For example, everybody talks about transparency in terms of learning analytics, what type of data we are going to collect and so on. However, some of that transparency can be also fairly counterproductive. For example, if you are telling very explicitly what we are trying to track, that people will start potentially gaming the system. And they are not going to have general engagement into certain types of behaviors. And thus, that basically type of parameter is becoming eventually quite obsolete. So therefore, there are certain things related to transparency and the dilemmas that we need to tackle, and many issues are not quite clear. Recently, an Australian university stopped all of their IRB or ethics application institution that were related to learning analytics because they needed to have clear guidance in terms of how they are going to make decisions. But interestingly, that institution had the official learning analytics policy that obviously wasn't specific enough how to have a mix between research and practice and research implementation and something that is crossing those boundaries. So there was another critical thing in many European countries as well. 
what we are finding, for example, in Germany, nobody wants to even talk at an institutional level about use of learning analytics. That a huge abuse of their and violation of their privacy and private data during the Second World War. And thus, Germans are very protective about their private data. And even if it's used for the purposes that we think that are quite noble, they are not necessarily quite happy about the idea. So what is necessary to move forward? And what are those critical steps and the activities that we need to think about for the interaction of learning analytics? So I'm going to frame the directions for moving forward in terms of the implementation of learning analytics about uh, around the model that was actually inspired by business analytics, and which is quite actually weird for me as well that I'm saying that I come here from the angle of business analytics, in particular because I've been kind of uh, always very antagonistic towards business analytics, right? As a dedicated academic, always saying, nah, <laughs> business, I, academia, we really don't go well. Together. Uh, and that was basically the case about, I think, about three years ago when I was on a panel in Melbourne, Australia, and there was a person from um, Deloitte and Touche, uh, and he was basically a business analyst, and he was also doing certain projects related to uh, K 12 education, etc., etc. Anyways, his primary position at one point was if you want to make certain things meaningful in analytics, we need to start from theories of the domain that we are dealing with. I said, well, that's exactly what I actually am suggesting as, a, as well. So we can use data science, but data science is not sufficient. We need to embrace theories. And the other point is uh, I'm going to touch on is also design. So, and based on that, we designed and kind of adopted this model that was proposed by McKinsey and Company. And it designed this model to be fairly simple, three elements when they are engaging senior leaders in different organizations and also other relevant stakeholders, so they can much easier communicate the messages. One was in composed of three elements, as I said, data, model, and uh, transformation. I'm gonna go quickly through those, and I'm gonna reflect on some of these critical things that we need to think about when we are uh, implementing learning analytics in higher education. So the first thing is in terms of data, and what we are talking about, what we are trying to collect, and what we are trying to do in terms of uh, data collection in higher education. In many institutions, uh, there is really kind of a uh, lots of focus on students evaluation. And many think the moment we talk about data in higher education for many administrators, that's really kind of what about students evaluation of teaching? And then many people are kind of even uh, uh, evaluated based on their success with respect to students evaluation of teaching. But we knew, and there was a recent meta-analysis as well, uh, which clearly indicated that there was no association between learning and student simulation of teaching. So it's really, but for me, it was a quite relevant thing to talk about because in the UK, there's something which is called teaching natural framework, which is a kind of audit-based quality assurance approach where all the universities are supposed to participate and then they would get certain levels like gold, uh, silver, and bronze. And based on that, they will be also able to charge or open up the amounts that they can charge students in terms of tuition fees. And one of the proxies of engagement was supposed to be national student survey, which is really purely student satisfaction. And it's certainly not students' uh, proxy of engagement. For me, I'm quite lucky to be in Scotland, and our Scottish government said, who cares about teaching excellence framework? We have something else. So uh, there's another critical thing is that if we are talking about self-reported data, they provide certain interesting insights that can actually tell us about people's conceptions of certain things. They can also give us interesting insights in, about students or people's attitudes and also tell us about you know, how they feel about certain things. However, we also know from the research in uh, educational psychology that we are highly inaccurate at calibrating our self-reports with our, what actually we are doing. There was a study in which we tried, to, in which Phil Winnick uh, and his PhD student at the time tried to do basically correlation between self-reported data students' uh, use of a particular system versus their actual use of the system. Students typically overestimate the amount of their actual effort that they put in the use of particular components of the system, and they are fairly kind of non-correlated with each other. 
So what we are actually suggesting in many cases is for institutions to think about civil engagement, but in a way that can be, first of all, theoretically grounded, and secondly, also that it's uh, building around some of these digital traces and the data that are more reflective of actual students' engagement. This is a model that we uh, developed based on the existing literature on MOOCs, and we are also kind of validating it for the application for classrooms as well in higher education. But a model builds on the existing work that is uh, developed uh, for, uh, for student engagement and by the authors called Reshley and Christensen, and starts basically from understanding the context in terms of demographics, uh, classroom context, and also individual needs, then talks about student engagement in, across uh, four facets. And we are talking about affective engagement, cognitive engagement, we are talking also about academic uh, engagement and behavioral engagement. And for all these elements of engagement, you can get relevant proxies out of the trace data that are coming from different types of technologies or even different types of systems that are tracking, for example, students' attendance, for example, um, relevant for academic engagement. But what we are also theorizing in this model is that these elements, these proxies of student engagement, are mediating your association with different levels of outcomes. So we can think in terms of immediate outcomes, something which is happening in real time, something which is the course level outcome, and something which is post-course outcome. What is the interesting thing about this model is that we not only theorize it, but we also statistically validated it. So we took data out of a first set of courses, and then we develop a, a structural equation models that actually show that the model really holds. It's interesting that the model is much better fit when we are collecting data from the courses that are from a similar discipline in a way that we are kind of recognizing also hierarchical nature of data that are available inside of our institutions. But it's something certainly as a promise that can be quite helpful in terms of data that many institutions already have and they can impact if they are using similar types of models. Of course, there's a very critical thing is that we need to be aware of the limitations of some of the data that are currently available. We are quite happy to say, oh, our students spend so much time online. But it, in many cases, we really don't know how much exactly time they spend on tasks. We run a study in which we want to kind of just to recognize the problem of students uh, and our inaccuracies of gauging the exact amount of time somebody spent for example, between what, what I mean here is, for example, if somebody clicked and opened a certain page and then the time to the next page. We really don't know whether that student just read whatever it's in there, or they were also chatting with their friend, or maybe watching who knows what type of other a website or the page that was available there. And so we try to basically uh, try to identify some of these so called outliers. For example, come here is a pure, say, really outrageously long, right? Three hours watching the same page or three days and so on. And we were then trying to kind of uh, investigate 15 different strategies in terms of which of them would be the best kind of way to mitigate some of these kind of unrealistic times. What we were able to find, uh, the consequences that depending on the strategy we would use to kind of deal with these outliers, we could actually affect the regression models that were trying to associate students uh, traces of engagement with the outcomes or students grades in the range of 15 to 20 percent in some cases in terms of R square values. So really in, in terms of the bias that our statistics and our kind of pre-processing methods are introducing are potentially huge, yet very few vendors are reporting how they are doing some of these estimations. That's the really one critical thing. And the second thing is for as, as far as our study goes, we were not able to conclude which of these strategies out of the 15 was the best. Because there are really other types of methods that are necessary for us to understand how and when students are on task. And there are some promising methods. For example, Ryan Baker and the colleagues developed a method which is called ROMs, where they are sneaking into classrooms and then trying to see what students are doing and kind of record whether they are on task or not. But they, they have really some interesting uh, methods how, how to do that. There's another critical thing in terms of data. Privacy and ethics needs to be considered. That's a really kind of big and scary thing for many 
institutions because there's lots of confusion. All of a sudden, data became so prevalent, so available everywhere, and the question is how we are dealing with that. Uh, five years ago, there was a really kind of a space where there was nothing. Everybody was puzzled and how we can do. Now there are actually some concrete uh, suggestions and recommendations. The first one was in the UK organization, which is called JISC. I don't know whether anybody heard of the organization JISC. It just stands for, uh, it's a non-departmental organization in the UK, which supports the entire UK side of that sector with ICT, right? And so they're also defining different types of policies and guidelines. And so one of them was a just code of practice for learning analytics. And that's basically, the, that's a fairly succinct document with about six or seven pages where they are suggesting institutions what are those critical kind of dimensions that they need to pay to re regarding ethics and privacy. But last year at the LAC conference, which is the main uh, major learning analytics event, only on major learning analytics event, uh, there was a paper which won the best paper award. And it's called uh, they proposed the delicate framework as a checklist. The things that they basically suggested that institutions need to pay attention to uh, as they are implementing learning analytics and trying to address privacy and ethical issues. Starting from a kind of a very clear determination of the questions that people are supposed to uh, be uh, to ask by means of learning analytics. The second one was explanation in terms of transparency what certain things are to be done with learning analytics and how it is going to affect different stakeholders. Also show the legitimacy of the approaches, for example, with respect to uh, different types of data sources and whether they make sense or not. Another critical thing, and I'm going to talk more about that, is involvement of stakeholders and making sure that students are on board from day one inside the process through many different ways, not only as kind of participants in different focus groups or surveys, but also members of your working groups where you are trying to design learning analytics strategies or policies. Also making sure that you deal with informed consent. Ask me what is the kind of gold standard, but it's opt-in or opt-out in terms of informed consent. There is no gold standard. That's something that each institution needs to figure out. In Europe, to a certain extent, that is not something that we, at this stage, are even kind of so much at liberty of debating in terms of ethical dilemmas. I think we have a new legislation, which is called General Data Protection Re Regulation, which pretty much clearly says it has to be opt-in. So for Europe, that's really very clear direction, how we are going to collect data and everything that's based by students opting in into the process, not basically uh, thinking in terms of whether they, they are by default opted in and they need to opt out. So then, then there's a need to anonymize certain things, and, and then there are different levels how you can anonymize. There are certain things that can be anonymized, and you, for example, don't have to worry so much if you're using data at the aggregate level about the informed consent. Running any personalized intervention, which is really the full, fully kind of uh, the core of learning analytics and personalization, then you really can't just anonymize certain things. So it was an interesting thing, problem for us as well at the University of Edinburgh uh, that our data protection officer said and wrote an opinion piece uh, three years ago that uh, learning analytics data can only be used in an anonymized way, which really blocked the entire pilot that we have with a major learning analytics vendor at the moment, which basically means that they developed some of these predictive models they were poured into certain dashboards, and then dashboards could only collect and contain anonymized data. So we can engage somebody's risk, yet we cannot know who is at risk. So I don't know what ethics of that kind of, uh, of that opinion piece was, but in any case, that basically will be ruled out that opinion piece once we have the institutional policies which is underway. We also need to think about technical procedures that are guaranteeing uh, privacy. So in many cases, we really kind of have difficulty to integrate all these different systems. And secondly, also to monitor where our data are being used. I think UC Berkeley has a really good thing, which is called a privacy dashboard, which tells people and the kind of stakeholders where and what particular types of data are being used inside of the university. And I think that's really one of the promises and directions which we also need to think. And then they can potentially then that dashboard and all of a sudden becomes also a place where people are kind of controlling or providing their informed consent or they are kind of 
opting out of particular types of things. And also in terms of external providers. That's been found in also in our work in Sheila. The most, the biggest concern students have when it comes down to the use of data. So students are expecting at least what we found that institutions are going to use their data. They are not, they are even surprised why universities are not using their data for improvement of their experience. However, they are concerned if their data are to be sold to third parties, or even if they are sent to third parties to analyze them, then they expect extra level of informed consent before that could be done. So this is something that institutions need to particularly pay attention to. In terms of modeling, we are talking really a lot, once we have collected our beautiful data, we need to also think about how we want to model the data, what we want to do. In many cases, uh, we are seeing lots of problems of data-driven methods. They are particularly relevant, say, in public health, epidemiology, marketing, and so on. But in most of those cases, we are talking about kind of very binary types of outcomes, then or not, cured or not, etc. Or in marketing, also people clicked or not. In education, really, we don't have so much, so many binary outcomes. In many cases, we have much more complex types of things. The other critical thing is that in many cases, we are seeing really the suggestion that we need to start from clear questions that are relevant. So we saw also from the examples that I was introducing initially in my talk, and that's basically the kind of Michigan, they had a very clear question at the university, uh, at Purdue University, they had a clear question, and, and many other places where we are talking to. What we are seeing is on the market, in particular, many of these learning analytics market providers are really just offering the magic of algorithms. They'll do all the magic, they'll give you all the answers, and then, yeah, and then you need to figure out your questions. I had a call like maybe four or five weeks ago from uh, one of those vendors, New One from the UK as well. They are now specialized for analytics in the UK. And so I, they first of all told me, oh, we, are, we offer retention. I told them, well, we don't have a retention problem at Edinburgh. Uh, we have 94, but you can still have 95. <laughs> sure, perhaps, but that's not really our kind of major priority. Uh, but then uh, I asked, okay, tell me, what else can you do? Well, you know what? We have this cool neural network. It can identify all the possible patterns, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, and, I, and that's really what they are offering. And I think, I mean, they, I've been talking, and I'm using this slide for, I don't know, the last two or three years, and I now witness it. Kind of first hand. <laughs> that, that's really what many of these vendors are doing. And imagine in many cases they are really trying to do that with uh, many senior leaders who don't have much understanding about analytics and how they are going to react to many of these things. Many people, often people are quite deceived by the kind of beauty of the process. What I'm really suggesting in this space when you are talking about modeling, we cannot reduce down learning, we cannot reduce down learning analytics just to data science. You need to include your theory, and that theory comes from two angles. One is really a theory with capital P, so different types. For example, in my research, I frequently do you know theories of social capital or something which comes from self-regulated learning, or often also with different types of linguistic types of theories that are coming from uh, the post from Memphis <coughs> and so on. But then in other cases, we also have our small theories with lowercase p. Those are something that's kind of coming from our practice, that comes from our institutional culture, certain things that are also predefined with the types of things that are also coming with the uh, specificities of certain uh, regions as well, and the legislation and the government policies that are defining such things. There's equally important dimension, and that's design. And design <coughs> really goes across both products of design and the process of design. In terms of design, really we need to think in terms of, first of all, learning designs. Because we know that learning designs are one of the most uh, potent agents that are guiding students' behavior inside of the learning environments. Uh, the second component of that uh, design element is the design of dashboards or interactive visualizations. In many cases, we don't really spend much attention on that. I'm going to unpack more, much more in my talk about uh, these things. Third component, and something that I believe uh, Joseph was talking a lot this morning, is design, uh, or study design. In many cases, really, we are making causal effects of many studies, although we have just correlational study designs. And to be very specific, even in terms of practical implications. 
So having that in mind, some really concrete few examples. <coughs> this really boils down the one first critical statement, which draws a particular published paper in which you said very explicitly, I think slightly corruptly, learning and learning are about learning. Or really by trying to emphasize that we should not be deceived by the promise just of the algorithms, but rather we need to ground our understanding of learning in the literature that comes from uh, uh, literature in learning uh, sciences, educational psychology, or general education before we can also go and make meaningful inferences that are coming and that are uh, being used in learning analytics. One of these critical things for learning analytics is that one size fits all doesn't really work at all. Uh, when I say one size, I mean critical dimensions where, for example, uh, talking about, if you're talking about the top, different institutions are quite different in terms of the political context in which they operate. They are affected by different types of government policies and different types of funding schemes that different governments are operating in particular systems. They're also different in terms of the student populations that they are serving. They're also different in terms of the internal cultures, also different historical decisions that are made in particular institutions, also differences in terms of the technological type of approaches and organizational structures. And also we are talking about individual differences when it comes down also to the level of uh, courses. Disciplinary differences are quite well established in terms of the categories people are using, but also in terms of the individual courses. And then finally, we also need to talk about the individual differences in terms of individual uh, learners. So just to kind of prove this point and the importance of really accounting for the contextual information, we ran a study in which we took uh, nine large enrollment courses from an Australian university. And in that process, we wanted to, first of all, kind of go back to the idea that uh, some people were kind of contemplating, why don't we use it, develop this beautiful big predictive model and then we use it across many contexts. And we did basically develop a predictive model of student success. We didn't really use any super sophisticated techniques. We just used both logistic and the linear regression. Uh, and then and with the linear regression, when we kind of lumped up all these data across different courses, we were able to predict uh, student traits or a significant model, explain about 21% uh, of the variability. But then when it came down to the kind of relevant predictors, we identified those that were useless in terms of pedagogical practice. That was the number of logins. And what boils down when you are actually having so diverse data sets across different pedagogical contexts, will actually identify the features that are least commonly known across all these different courses. However, when we use the models that were able to account for this hierarchical, for this hierarchical nature of data, by really trying to say that a particular course has its own different instructional design and guided students towards particular different types of learning opportunities and different types of behavior. Then we were able, in some cases, for some individual courses, to explain almost 75% of the students' grades based on their behavioral data, and some other cases, zero. When we talked to the course instructor where there was zero percent, they asked us, you know, why we looked into Moodle, because there was nothing in Moodle in their course. But when we are trying really to kind of have these big predictive models that really are completely washing away the contextual information, we are also going to have lots of junk is going to be out as well. And that's really one of the critical messages for institutions. The other critical myth is that if you don't account for individual differences properly in the literature, is that more time online means better learn. And that's not really quite true. What we are finding is that in most of the cases, like, there's a group of learners who spend enormous amounts of time learning and they're quite consistent. You can basically say they are highly motivated yet they are not the best learners in the class. They're just, in many cases, quite a lot struggling because they need more time and they're not also probably quite as uh, competent in many cases. There's a group of students frequently who is just around the average in terms of their overall engagement, yet they are the top students in the class. They frequently come uh, from a very kind of uh, high prior knowledge and also they come with high study skills and thus their level of engagement is not necessarily high, yet they are highly efficient in the ways how they are studying. Therefore, we need to account for these individual differences and these study strategies students are following and how these study strategies are 
changing over time and how we can determine which is really the critical dimension if you're talking about learning analytics. Final place is the transformation. And that's the place where we also need to think very carefully about the ways uh, how we can have uh, our institution adopt learning analytics. This is a model that we developed while we were doing the study in Australia, but we are observing that the model is also equally relevant in other studies as well. What we basically found is that for any institution to make a systemic adoption, which would really, in kind of general case, translate the interest of academic or teaching staff into uptake in terms of the implementation, that we need to start from the development of strategic capability inside an institution. And that strategic capability primarily constitutes development of leadership, making sure that there are relevant skills available inside of the organization. In many cases, that really means also hiring learning analytics experts who can also provide that kind of academic leadership, not only just the institutional leadership. We also found that in most of institutions which had kind of senior leadership sponsorship of their projects and also this kind of expertise expertise in terms of learning analytics for those that were much uh, more uh, kind of poised to uh, make a success and the impact inside of their institutions. In terms of leadership, in terms of the strategic capability, you also need to think in terms of the infrastructure. For example, for us in Edinburgh, it took for like months and months of negotiation between our student records that are responsible for our student services and our information services just to basically be able to link two data sets. And that's really, in many cases, quite significant. Some institutions don't have that type of a problem. But it really is telling, telling you about the strategic type of capability. And we are also talking about the relevant space of opportunities for training inside our institution that is going then eventually to influence the development of the implementation of capability. How well you can implement some of these cool ideas or not, and also translate some of these interesting things that are coming from research uh, and also the tools that can go go eventually into the implementation. What we basically found that there are generally two types of approaches that institutions are taking. The first type of approaches we call them a solution problems. And then those are in many cases we do a digital product, right? They are also different in terms of the ways how they are conceptualizing learning. They are typically kind of uh, limiting down to a single dimension, but that's in many cases just re uh, retention, right? So what is happening in many cases, that's really a strategic capability just to focus on the tool and the implementation. What happens in many cases, they are not aiming to encourage the, or kind of leverage the interest that was available across different uh, stakeholders inside an university. And in many cases, they also have no uh, clear strategy in terms of training and the innovation promotion across the institution. Rather, they are trying to implement a particular system and just kind of trying to go with that system. What we also so far observed, and in many cases, that kind of strategy can bring some benefits for a couple of years, and that basically then they exhaust the entire potential. And they cannot really kind of go and move it to the next step because they are not promoting, promoting for example, teaching excellence, and thus they have difficulties in terms of students' uh, overall experience enhancement. There are other institutions, however, that are more, we call them process products. They have a much more kind of comprehensive view to learning. They recognize the multifaceted construct, which basically has dimensions of motivation, dimensions of uh, uh, cognition, dimensions of metacognition, social learning, and so on. But then what we are also finding in such institutions, in many cases, they have traces of all these other elements like, for example, implementation capability, availability of some tools, etc. However, the challenge for many of these institutions is basically they have some of these pockets of quite innovative work. Yet the challenge is how to scale it up or to advertise it across the entire institution, right? And there are some really great examples. I always go back to the example of University of Michigan. But at the same time, the University of Michigan invested millions of dollars to establish something which is called uh, digital uh, education innovation dream house. And so that the faculty members who have certain innovation, that innovation is proved to work well in their practice, then they can get resources to kind of scale it up inside the institution, plus also even uh, market it across the entire institution. 
very few institutions, however, are able to set up a unit of 50 or 60 people uh, that can do something like that. But what we are finding, basically, in some other institutions, like, for example, University of College of Sydney, they are setting up a much smaller unit, uh, which has maybe five or six people who are responsible. And lot, lots of that innovation happens, and they also have different uh, types of, uh, if you wish, fellows across the university that are innovating and also working with the with the, their IT unit and also the, the team that is responsible for innovation promotion. And that basically is the case that as I believe many institutions are considering in terms of the kind of uh, promising direction for learning, strategic learning uh, implementation. We also need to be very kind of clear with respect to inclusive approaches to adoption of learning analytics. And with that, I think the really the crucial thing is that we should stop just thinking in terms of like think about these kind of data cycles. Like we have our users, we collect data, we process data, and we present it back. Rather, we need to really talk about different stakeholders in terms of uh, their different uh, perspectives, different concerns. Some of them are concerned with obviously adaptivity and personalizations, but other, others have concerns related to privacy and ethics. Others have concerns with accountability or responsibility or things related to interoperability of different data sources. So how do we actually account for all these different sources of uh, concerns in our institutions? I think it's quite unique for every institution. And that's what we are trying to do in Sheila is we are trying to basically uh, design a framework which will serve as an umbrella for our action implementation. So the framework is based on something which is called rapid outcome mapping approach. I'm going to quickly talk about that as well. And uh, that framework itself really is guiding institutions how to engage different stakeholders, how to go about the process of learning analytics, strategy and policy definition, and also how to iterate this process. Because learning analytics is never basically going to be a finished product, right? You'll do certain things, and then you will have to iterate after two or three years once you have learned and to try to think how to move forward. forward. In the process, we basically talk to several stakeholders. We talk to experts. Uh, and experts, for example, told us uh, that privacy and ethics are the most important concerns related to higher education policy. However, they are also easiest to implement. However, what they also told us, uh, second most important concern was risk management. However, that was something which was difficult to implement. Because you really can't predict what possible risks you may encounter in the views of data and how certain things may go wrong. When we also talk to students, uh, we basically found that students have a high level of expectation of the use of their data. And we, based, we designed, uh, we collected input from students two ways. One was to have the focus groups with students. The second one was to design the instrument which basically followed a very rigorous psychometric process that a psychology PhD student who is doing that whole thing for his thesis. And eventually we kind of narrowed it down to a 12 item questionnaire, a liquid, liquid scale. Each question, each item would actually have two liquid scales. The one would ask students to give us the ideal expectations from the institution regarding ethics, privacy, and also particular types of services. And the other ones, basically, what I expect would happen in reality and their prediction. What I found, for example, they had a high expectation that teaching staff would be competent to use analytics in their teaching practice. That's the ideal case. Yeah, there was the biggest gap with their kind of ideal expectation versus what they expected to happen in reality. They expected that teaching staff would not be ready. Uh, then the other thing was also quite interesting when we countered the perspectives of students and teaching staff. There was something which is called Call of Duty, or whether institutions have the obligation to act when that data suggests so. What we found so far is students are very clearly, and that was one of the strongest uh, kind of uh, expectations from the institution, was that institutions and teaching staff have the obligation to act, while the teaching staff don't think so. Uh, in many cases, they would tell us because students are not in higher education, they need to. We don't want to interfere with the agency, and they're on their own. And I think I think both sides are 
right to a certain extent. But I think we also need to account for the developmental uh, nature of kind of learning. Maybe students in early days of their education, in higher education, as well need to have more support. But in over time, they are also advancing in less, and thus we also need to kind of prepare them to be more independent learners. There was really one interesting thing. The other critical thing is that given that many teaching staff don't have still clear idea how learning analytics can be used in their uh, uh, in their teaching practice, and in many cases they don't really even know what and how learning analytics systems look like. They were just concerned primarily and exclusively with the workload. So when you look at their qualitative video that we received from them, basically workload is just jumping out of it. And in many cases, many of them expected, as if with learning analytics, they will now need to just download data from all these different sources. They will be responsible for their joining, and they will be responsible for spending days of on time spending in, I don't know, SPSS or whatever tool that they are supposed to use. Rather than thinking about maybe learning analytics will be also uh, provided to them through certain environments that are going to streamline the, that entire process and potentially also, in many cases, to maybe reduce some of their things. And this really goes back to kind of this kind of whole debate of data, analytics, and artificial intelligence to automate certain professions. And maybe somebody is going to talk about the data of teaching, right? Yet many of the teaching fac uh, faculty members at least at the University of Edinburgh, they think that learning analysis is going to increase their workload. So I guess that's good news. I mean, it means more work for us. Do you mind what you said about getting increasing workload is already interesting point? Mm. Or at least in perceptions, especially because whenever we try to make any kind of technology innovation, if the technology wants to study, we can get in this comment. So do you have any thoughts on you know how we would approach that? Or like you said, is the thing that's revalued yet? Is that we have to choose solutions that reduce workload? Do you have thoughts on how you kind of bring this new technology or systems that could be useful when they're already overloaded? No, no, that, that, that's a great question. I, I think there are certain things that are quite uh, tricky. I mean, we know, and these are not things that are specific to learning analytics. I think you're kind of what's spot on when saying any kind of innovation or any technology. I mean, we know there are certain models that are coming from innovation diffusion, right? So they are trying to identify certain champions, and these champions are trying to kind of uh, promote certain things, but they are also coming from practice, and they also have very clear practical solutions. In many cases, there are Clearly embedded into the fabric or the kind of uh, or the culture <coughs> of certain environments. So, for example, me to make a clear impact in say the school of computing, I need to be a huge champion for this world, who is also teaching some of these kind of major courses in computing as well. And then this is the first thing I can then say, and I have this credibility in my faculty to whom I'm saying this is how I did it, and then increase my workload, right? And then the institutions themselves, in terms of uh, approaches need to celebrate these types of cases. In many cases, students are trying to provide certain types of grants for innovation, etc. But in many cases, uh, my kind of uh, perception is that there's no clear way to evaluate the effectiveness of some of the grant, these grants and the extent to which we can actually promote and they are promoting such innovation. We are happy about them, but in, again, in many cases, like many things in higher education, we kind of believe. So we kind of use our gut feeling rather than we have very strong evidence of some of these ranking schemes. So this is the final product that we are training inside of the Shiva project. Uh, it says six steps. We didn't invent these six steps. Uh, we built on a framework which is called, uh, as I said, Roma, Rapid Outcome Mapping Approach, which was designed to translate scientific evidence onto policy. And uh, the process starts by identifying clearly the political context, then going to identify stakeholders, uh, then tries to then identify the desired behavioral changes in a way, what are those things that we expect that learning analytics will help us to do inside of our institution. Also to develop the engagement strategy, how we are engaging different stakeholders, how we are addressing the challenges that just inside of our institution. Also, then analyze, and these process typically go hand in hand in parallel. Analyze institutional capacity. For example, we say we need data uh, about students, say, enrollment and attendance, and also from the LMS. But then, can we really 
kind of integrate these two systems. And what is the institutional readiness to do something like that? And of course, the final point is with respect to establishing monitoring and learning frameworks for institutions, how we learn, how we measure the success on the implementation of learning and all this. In many cases, we are not really quite clear how to do that. In many cases, we are suggesting more kind of qualitative, certain type of quantitative instruments as well, like for example, change perception inside an institution, but also analytics itself as a way to kind of measure the impact of certain uh, courses and the ways how certain things are done. But I think uh, while we are fairly kind of uh, maturing some of these areas, this is the area we are at least mature in terms of the implementation of learning analytics. Yes, please. So we talked at the beginning that a, a attrition would not be the ideal thing to look at. But when we think about the attrition measurements, is they do go across all courses. They're very easy to explain. Clearly, all the stakeholders agree it's a good thing. We don't have attrition. Maybe even not having students fail courses or have to repeat. Yeah, is, is there anything else that you've seen that um, as evidence of something spreads, it's a good thing, like things that institutions are trying to um, get evidence that something good is happening other than reducing attrition and, and repeats? I could talk about my institution, and they would be very glad to increase student satisfaction. So student satisfaction yeah. would be the next one. I think that which, is equally, which is equally, I, I don't like it, but okay. okay. But yes, there'll be something that goes across the entire institution, and in particular, there are there are institutions across the UK, and I know even Australia, that are primarily focused on improvement of student satisfaction with people for certain elements that are related to their uh, experience in high school. And if I could, it seems like a best-in-class school that has the one that comes after that, the next thing they track that. So like a particular skill or behavior or right so that's or not something that i've seen that many institutions did particular skill i know that there are uh, in many australian <laughs> universities developing all sorts of relevant uh, systems that are trying to promote some of these types of skills uh, but they haven't really figured the way how they will implement analytics uh, inside of that process i personally would see a lot of it Promise, especially because in many cases they really nicely map kind of a course outcomes onto some of the graduate attributes or they map out like the program outcomes, etc. But then they have a really kind of sweet opportunity as well to kind of think in terms of the assessments, etc., and the extent to which some of these graduate attributes are promoted or not. And we, we just started recently doing some work with uh, teachers education. Uh, institutes where they are trying to uh, try to map out some of these elements of their so-called non-cognitive type of things that are requested for their professional accreditation, and that is a one direction that we are talking about. But that's not really what is coming across the entire institution. Okay. Pleasure. So, picking on that question further, I have you seen any work that deals with, let's say, lifelong learning or assessment via internship satisfaction or, or things of that sort, which would be beyond the institutional walls? So right, uh, I do some of that work. Uh, we actually have a whole system which we call ProSolo, and uh, that system is precisely trying to address the challenges of that. So the system, unlike most of the LMSs, uh, uh, is not course-centered but it's the learner center. And learners have certain types of skills that are based on their professions, right? They need to kind of uh, do things. They can also collect the evidence across many different uh, places, right? So there are certain systems such as uh, people, uh, PeoplePad, I think, and similar types of portfolio types of systems, but in many cases, they are similar to quite open to kind of have that easily evidence that is across many different platforms. So we basically allow uh, learners to kind of go there and different professions, they already kind of trying to use portfolios, but in many cases, portfolios are fairly messy because they are like portfolio tools are also kind of primarily focused on content design, etc. So we try to then uh, ask learners to map that at particular types of competencies that are being relevant. Then based on these uh, evidences, uh, and once they are collected, they are sent for assessment. And different institutions have different ways how they are thinking about assessment or different competencies. So in some cases, peer is uh, acceptable. In other cases, external expert, for example, placement. Like we talk to nursing schools, schools and for nurses like or doctors who are supervising them are those who could potentially provide certain types of uh, assessments that are kind of 
validating some of their evidences. In other cases, more kind of the formal mentor that they have inside of the school who is assessing some of these evidences. And with the way by mapping those external evidences, then we also are now building analytics in terms of understanding what kind of pathways different students are following, which of these pathways are most optimal for them to meet certain types of competences, and most importantly, also how and what type of advice they are getting from different types of instructors. Have you seen any institutions that are doing a good systematic job of that, of mapping um, like placement of salary back to um, data being captured during the learning process? I have not. But yes. Uh, this is this is a great overview of, uh, of, of, of a lot of things that are interesting. So when you talk about this one, right now a lot of universities, especially in the U.S. and other places, they have uh, often close institutions, institutional research office. Yep. Basically, uh, it's it's more like a rule. Everybody, every university is supposed to have that, right? Yep. So do you know when, since when they actually mandate that something need to be there? Because that process will probably help you. To 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 you know uh, increase adaption of, of the learning analytics, right? Is there any kind of like a, a Congress or an IES kind of uh, say, oh, you have to open the data uh, mm -hmm. for that? Right now, you can you can have those. So I wonder, you know, this is you know this is a similar kind of approach. Is you're more like a you know, FDA or something like okay, now from now you you just have to get all those things there, right? So, uh, you know, because this is something that I, I can imagine either you can open a company or something that helps you here. Now, I take care of this because different institutions, different leadership, they put different emphasis. Even in, in right now, you look at the institution office, uh, research office, some of the places there's a lot of information, some of them just, just the numbers, right? right? So, the similar situation you have, like uh, adaption of uh, learning analytics. Right? So, no, I think you're right, and I think. I would also personally kind of think in Canada they would also have institutional research offices as well, right? Yeah. And I would kind of first hand to think of there would be new specials for your face the place for that. However, what is happening in most of the cases they really come from more kind of a business intelligence yeah, yeah, tradition. Yeah. And they have a completely different lens. They are kind of focused on these kind of very general uh, reports that are relevant for uh, higher level institutional leaders, but they are not really offering much insight that is actionable for teaching staff. And so the question is really how institutions recognize. I personally don't see the type of a push that would come from legislation. I don't think in Europe it would to happen. I think we have even bigger fights to kind of uh, put in terms of like in just convincing that we can use data in some of the countries like Germany. But I think in other cases, maybe that really is something that is, would be quite actually suitable and possible in some other countries. I mean, for example, we have one of the partners in Europe, which is a Sony. And they don't have any privacy concerns whatsoever. Their culture is very clear. This brings us and improves our efficiency. OK, you're going to use it. Everybody is very comfortable with that. That's the first thing. The second thing is that they are very comfortable that they would join up all their systems, like write LMS data with whatever government has about me. And, and in such systems, that is possible, right? I, I can't possibly think of a future case when that will happen in the UK. That, why don't say that will never happen in the UK? Well, never say never, but uh, I don't think it makes five to 10 years for sure. You know, this type of a logic, right? Germany even later than that. So I think if it's if you think the way that would be done in the US, why not? And I, I guess I mean the US has different kind of dimension. Yeah, and I, I see that, that even you right now you can go really go to those uh, those institutional offices. They have you know tables for us, you know, faculty salaries, you know, uh, you know like a year and okay, oh okay, you know, geez, you go, so you're catered to students, to parents, to uh, uh, you know, like the teachers, professors, and then those also use it for the school kind of principal to get present to brag sure. about himself, right? Yes. But it's not really at the detail like the one you're talking about. Exactly. And, and so I really don't know sufficient enough, but I, I know that it's a, also a big political game, right? And also it's a kind of a potentially dangerous game as well if you kind of mandate too much because then everybody will try to then look for the indicators that are suitable like your question was like that apply across the entire system. 
and it might be quite difficult to kind of prove simply because what is a good indicator in medicine doesn't necessarily apply to humanities or social sciences and then and whatever types of and, and also in terms of some of these like 21st century types of graduate attributes whether it's actually global citizenship critical thinking and so on the critical thinking in like medicine is quite different from critical thinking in say yeah. philosophy but there are parallels for example if, if i'm a doctor i'm prescribed this medicine at least i know what it's a side effect yeah now i'm a professor i say okay oh, use this course what is the side effect Mm. Like Alex, uh, I think uh, you mm. mentioned, right? Yeah. It's great teaching, but I either have a student hate that matter. It's too hard. Yeah. So that the, the, you, you kill or you, you, you help them to learn, but they end up lost interest. Yeah. So that's a side effect. That's sure. should be documented. Or, yeah. you know, like in a, you, you go buy a, buy a talent or you, you, you know what you want to eat, what not to eat, right? Sure. So, no, I agree. I agree. No, I com completely agree on that. I think I mean, we even need to think in terms of learning all this uh, at a level that is not anymore just about these very real indicators, but also in terms of like collecting insights that teachers or teaching staff are making based on some of these indicators. So we can actually build the next generation of learning analytics that is well now trying to say, already predict some of these potential insights as well as also to kind of look into the effects of some of these interventions. And they are nicely codified across many different dimensions. And then based on that, we can collect that type of systematic evidence in many cases. So I agree with that. Big nice. All right, I have a few more things to say. So this framework is going to come as a kind of a table, which has uh, several columns. The first one is what actions you suggest that we identified in practice. What challenges we also identify in practice? What questions that are relevant? And you can see that we're also identifying some of these questions are like ethics management, privacy, or uh, data management for stakeholder engagement, and also what type of instruments we suggest that institutions may use to collect additional insight to gauge their internal uh, situation. Uh, in many cases, people are asking us, well, why don't you actually uh, kind of rank some of these? insights like for example the actions or some of these challenges given the diversity of the institutions and uh, differences that they have while well while something is a, of the highest priority in one institution may be completely obsolete in another institution and therefore we have a really hard time to actually do make, make that kind of rank place of the things so there are some of the institutions and nus sign up as the associate partner so we'll be communicating these documents uh, for further consultation with associate partners and for kind of their maybe whether whatever they want to do with it, whether they want to provide us with some comments, whether they want to further work with us, or they simply say, well, okay, it was a useful piece of information and that's it. But we basically are going to take it further from there. So we have no expectations, but more kind of something that we give back to the community as the outcome of this uh, whole process. So in terms of kind of how we follow this whole process in Russia, Edinburgh as well, in terms of implementation, we basically started, uh, and uh, when I was hired as well as uh, chair in learning analytics and informatics two years and a half ago, we started actually having several projects. There were already certain projects, I wrote certain projects, and then people started asking, oh, well, you are using data inside an institution. What is the process that's not transparent? How we can make it visible? And so we started consolidating some of these processes and we were asked also by one of our vice principals at the time to create a kind of a grid as well. Which of these projects are more kind of student focused, institution focused, and also which of these projects we are working just at kind of our level as an institution and on which projects we are collaborating with. Obviously we are collaborating a lot, so there are many different types of projects. So we want to kind of make this thing quite explicit. We will be able also to find it on the web. We want to kind of provide that information to the stakeholders. We then start with the Sheila, but then at the same time, we used action research as well to develop institutional policy. So the University of Edinburgh is a very old university. It was founded in 1583. Uh, very complex structure as well. It has generally a general level three colleges. Uh, one is medicine and vet medicine, science and engineering. Second one and third one is the social sciences, humanities and arts. Each of them is a small university and there are, as I said, nine different LMSs. Very few things that are could be done easily centralized way. Up until a year ago, there was even 
that zero seeding had with the centralized student evaluation uh, system, right? That they were kind of running across many different schools. Obviously, lots of internal politics, lots of different power structures, 12,000 uh, staff members across the university and, and 35,000 students. So we decided to set up our policy as a kind of a two-phase process. Phase one for us, we decided to develop uh, just the principles and the purposes for learning analytics. That's really when it comes down to an institution which doesn't have any big pressing problem, yet you also want to improve many things. You then need to invent your analytics, what you want to do. But before even you engage in terms of learning analytics, you want to understand and try to think about the potential risks and be upfront in terms of what analytics cannot or can be used for. So we first of all indicated certain principles. We indicated that data is always incomplete and no major decision about service can be made without a human in the loop. But when we say no major decision, that means really you don't want to send out soon of the university just by uh, sending an automated message as well. Rather, those type of major decisions need to really have a human in the loop. We also recognize that data and algorithms can perpetuate bias in some cases. There was a study run by the current president of the International Data Education Data Education Data Mining Society with Nikola Pechenitsky, in which he studied, for example, the extent to which certain biases that are available data can perpetuate bias. For example, in IT, we know that there are very few women. And if and you would identify a gender as one of these critical predictors. And so that basically could then delegate completely the decision making to the algorithm. So, like the students, you'll have even fewer women over time. That basically one of those. Uh, also, avoidance of the deficit model. So, we want to have analytics not only for student retention, but also to unlock the entire potential of all our students. Facilitation of training is a critical thing that we need to provide it across the university if we want to uh, have new learning analytics. And this is one of the critical things as well. Those are. Uh, that learning analytics is not used for performance assessment. Uh, there was a uh, there would be a huge pushback from the faculty union if that was suggested. Uh, our medics were not happy with this. They said, "No, we want to use analytics to prove our teaching excellence." And I can see a reason why this would not be used. And so we basically then say, "Well, voluntarily, it still can be used, uh, and also further consultation is." Uh, uh, provided, but in some other schools, like in informatics, people were very unhappy. This was not reassuring them. Out. They still felt that analytics will be used as an instrument of control inside the university. So, so there are different schools and different, and you would expect that people from computing would be quite actually happy with the use of and trying to automate certain things. We also define certain pur purposes for analytics in terms of quality, equity. So we see the analytics to help us identify a certain kind of challenges that are related to uh, equity inside university and also evaluate the extent to which actions that the university is taking uh, to improve equity in some areas are actually taking place. Also, we're talking about personalized feedback and coping scale in particular in terms of university's growth and especially university is growing in online operating and that's one of the strategic priorities. So we at the moment have 3,000 students up until 2010. 2020 is expected to have 10,000 online learners. Uh, and so, and also we are talking about improvements, for example, skills of students to deal with data at all. So we see the opportunity for learning analytics to address some of these challenges. All right, so I'm not going to talk much about the last one. I'm going to talk more about it tomorrow. So really just a few final remarks. Rhetorics of, uh, rhetorics of, com of kind of simple technological fixes doesn't really work in higher education. We know that and equally doesn't work. With learning analytics. Embracing complexity in educational systems is really what we need to do if you want to make impact of, with any technology in particular if you're actually thinking about data. Because data eventually are talking about changing systems. Data are requiring and intrinsically are thinking about changing certain processes. And also critical important thing is that analytics is not a, a problem of computer scientists or a problem of just administrators or teaching staff or psychologists, but it's a problem of all of us. And really only those institutions that have multidisciplinary teams in place that are responsible for learning analytics are poised to make some success. Final point is 
we know that the higher education institutions and education in general do not have the tradition of data informed culture. So the challenge of data uh, informed culture development is big. I was last week in Hong Kong and somebody asked me, how would you suggest we develop culture? Well, if I knew, I'd probably be making millions how to do that. But in many cases, I think it's really, when you talk about culture, one way it may work in Edinburgh, but it doesn't mean it will work here in Singapore. You need to figure out your own way how you are developing your culture or decision uh, making based on data. And this is really what I want to say. Uh, I said a lot. Uh, you also said a few things. We still have a few minutes for uh, conversation. Yes, please. Thank you for your help. This is quite insightful. Given the gravity and complexity of the uh, challenges, uh, how can institutions? Uh, I mean, I, I would imagine most institutions are not able to do all this overnight, so they they might have to do it incrementally. How might that be possible? What what sort of steps can they take in order to reach? No, that's a great question. It's a definitely incremental process, and uh, something that requires. I can tell. I mean, obviously, um, it requires really. I, I would say that some of these steps that I outlined are really built at the time. So first of all, the things that are related to kind of the political context. What are those drivers that are relevant for an institution? For example, in Europe, we are finding generally three kind of dimensions. Those that are kind of more um, learner focused, they want to enhance the experience of some of their learners. Institutional kind of uh, or teachers focus, like how can they empower their teachers? And then there are external type of pressures that institutions feel that they have. Like for example, in the UK was this kind of notion of teaching excellence framework, and then the notion that we need to kind of jump on the learning uh, analytics uh, uh, bank of those kind of boards to make sure that we don't miss the opportunity, otherwise everybody else will be ahead of us. So really kind of understanding what are those critical drivers that are out there. And also then thinking once you have understood some of these drivers, and think about who are the relevant stakeholders in your environment. What we are actually finding is always two key groups, thinking the representative students and teaching staff. In many cases, students union the representatives are really good to kind of the historic <coughs> parties and provide input. But then there are additional two groups that have to be present. First of all, somebody from the senior leadership team inside the institution could be kind of the sponsor of the project, if you wish. And also that individual could help the broker connection with the critical professional groups inside an institution. So those would be the groups that are responsible, for example, for academic development, IT, and additional kind of, for example, student services or student counsel. Without their involvement, you may end up with all sorts of problems. For example, I was in Canada, it was a challenge. Uh, vice president, academic wants to promote uh, innovation, funded projects, projects were all going well. Uh, they were developing technologies, but when it came down to the deployment of these projects onto the operational LMS, they were using Apple Canvas, uh, I said, no, that's against our policy. And, and so it took us a while. So making sure that you get all these relevant stakeholders on board on day one, it's really critical. And then start to engage with them as you're shaping on the How do you get um, students involved with the analytics system and get uh, and, uh, so uh, we actually had several things that were related to the, to the system. First of all, we uh, put their student representatives, and so we kind of created certain types of policy and messages, how they were communicated. The second thing was really done through the uh, one project was done through kind of very kind of user centric design with students. So students were on, they were participating in some of these co creation type of activities of the types of analytics they would like to see. And then these analytics were eventually given to them to be used inside of the courses. The sad truth is that students didn't want to use those eventually. So although they created them and everything, they still didn't find much value of them. Where we are finding that the analytics really came, and at least in our case, as a tool to empower teaching staff. And, and so not the students themselves necessarily, but rather understanding the needs of students and then using teaching staff as the medium kind of. Uh, no, in the process between the students' needs and the analytics and science. right? So, so yeah, so those, those are some of these. So those are the kind of first steps for institution. Uh, 
of course, you, you want to kind of detect also and define early in the process of a small project as well that can help you to reassess kind of as a stress test as well. What, what can your decision do with analytics? And try to then have a governance group that is composed of these relevant stakeholders. And that the early project can actually tell you what can potentially be done or not inside of your institution. And then start to think about kind of your vision for the institution. Other comments or disagreements? Suggestions? Yes, I think one of the concerns about um, these kinds of systems are that the, the data that comes out might be sensitive, uh, that there might be political groups or uh, different groups on, on campus that uh, might uh, 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 be uh, disadvantaged or, or that um, or, or that the university might be um, labeled as being, you know, uh, against with uh, misogynistic or whatever because of some of the data that comes out. Um, is is um, is there? How do you? What what do you do um, in terms of thinking through what sorts of data um, can can be used and, and what sort of analysis um, can be used in the data set? Or is it open? University doesn't care about that. No, I, th I think you are right. I mean, there are, there are not really so many people that are necessarily looking into kind of these uh, ethics-based uh, uh, data mining, right? I, I think Nikolai is one of the very few, Nikola Pachinitsky, who is looking into some of these issues. And there are many different types of human strategies, various in which you can actually upfront say that there are some of these biases. But then inside of your uh, analytical models, then you can account for these biases and uh, try to either minimize them, right? Or eliminate, right? right. But uh, the problem with the machine learning is that they are intrinsically kind of biased towards the database on which the models were trained, right? And there are some of these like examples where, like for example, where the model was completely racist, like right. trying to kind of uh, classify people right. based on their photos, based on the kind of uh, whether they were a certain race, and it was completely trained on a kind of Caucasian data set, right? And then everybody would be Caucasian regardless of. Oh, the, and so the, the, the kind of the, the classifier was a complete racist threat right, in, that, in, the, in that sense. So we need to kind of account some of these things and, and the, the things that are potentially limiting us. In some cases, uh, there are also types of pedagogies, inclusive pedagogies, uh, that are available in the literature that are actually suggesting us that we don't have to, the way how we communicate some of these things that are identified. They're not coming from the weaknesses of the say of the minorities but rather actually take from their advantages and use that basically as their advantage in the way how you're engaging with them. And, and that's been something that's true in the kind of literature quite effective to work with many cases where they were trying to, to work with different populations and going to try to go from these kind of deficit type models. Because nobody wants to kind of be labeled as somebody who has certain deficit. <laughs> Initial project to identify. So, in your Shila project, did all the universities use the same kind of questionnaire uh, or something to identify the needs? Uh, so the needs themselves, uh, not the same type of questionnaire. I mean, it, so yes and no. So uh, yes, in terms of to understand the expectations of students and teaching staff, they all use the same instrument that we develop and use it. We, we found that students are highly, really interested to participate in participating. We got really good response rates. We got, we tried to kind of sample, carry about 6,000 students. We got more than 700 students in Edinburgh. You know, for example, uh, doing a similar work with uh, openers in the Netherlands, they have less than 18,000 students, more than 1,000 students sort of responded to the survey from that university and several other universities. So what we found is really hard to get involvement from so <laughs> it's really hard, right? And when they get involved, and they are also fairly negative as well, like very close, very close, very close. So you would think that those, you would hope that those who responded to our survey and Edinburgh would target. First of all, for us, it was easy to also approach students that there is a central team that is responsible in university for doing surveys. They already had a clear sample methodologies, 
and they told us, well, you know, if you address this number of this many students, I can guarantee you'll get this many responses. They were like within the range of 10% accurate because they knew their target audience. But it comes down to faculty. There's no centralized list for university that you can use there. And so our kind of engagement was to go to the heads of schools and kind of asking them to forward it to faculty members. And in my case, it didn't really. Although I, I had a really kind of the convener of the group, I was appointed by the Senate and the court of the university. And so all these things, and there was a Senate out of, uh, as a member of the group, was also director of academic services. So it was not like pure Senate, it was just a research study. Still, really hard with any topic. So we got only like the same survey of about 80 responses from uh, potentially 8,000 faculty members that we had in their survey. <laughs> but what were you? What were you looking to do with that? It's not a vote, right? No. It's, uh, so how do you make a decision on, you know, on, for instance, the, the, you, you brought up opt-in and opt-out, um, and that's obviously a, a cultural and and um, a perspective of, from your, your mm -hmm. school environment that reflects that. I, I saw an article in the paper um, in China, they would have they have cameras in all the classrooms versus um, a camera in a classroom at Harvard that doesn't identify faces but just looks at whether or not someone's sitting in a chair or not became a front page article. So it's, there's that cultural uh, sure. piece, and then um, so how do you so you, how do you take that into account when you? when you make a decision in terms of what's the right, right. policies. Right, so just before to kind of return back to faculty members, that we, there was another way how we engaged and we got lots of people. It was basically that we communicated and we used this phase one for really awareness traits regarding learning links and how to use using the discourse. So what we did is we sent it to all the schools and their learning and teaching communities. And in many cases, we were so much about 15, 20 people. And in some cases, it would be the whole school. Uh, meeting as well. And so I would go and present this kind of policy case, and then we would solicit that type of treatment. So, to that way, we found that we were able to engage, uh, I, I would say, close to thousand faculty members, online based, trying to serve the faculty members, and so on. So, there was one way. In terms of the cultural things, uh, so opting or op opting out, I think one thing is, of course, polling and getting the sense, but I think the more, much better insight we got uh, about some of these issues when we had the focus group with students. We actually then understood what are those troubling things. In many cases, really, these focus groups for us were quite revealing in terms of the needs for learning analytics and that's the decision for our to focus on feedback. The students were quite frustrated with the ways uh, how feedback or feedback was not communicated to them in many cases. Uh, they didn't really all. Uh, any strong opinions related to opt-in or opt-out. They just expected transparency. There was really the biggest concern. Transparency not only in terms of they were aware when they were uh, kind of registering for every year that they had to also give informed consent, but they were not quite sure how their data were going to be used. And that's where it's a bit of transparency there was. Uh, for us at this stage, also opt-in or opt-out or how we are going to designate it's also equally a legal challenge because we have the year of this general data uh, protection regulation, which kind of creates lots of uncertainty. How exactly? So we waited for the appointment also data protection officer at the university, and who is a legal person who can give us action advice. So while we can actually make our users comfortable, we also have to be legally compliant. And so I think we are heading much more likely to measure towards opting simply because the legal legislation requires us to have the opt-in consequently solved on as part of the process. However, the level where you are opting in or opting out is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so according to the legislation, it's you're opting in from the individual services. However, you may not, or the service providers, in our case also universities, do not have to provide you opt-out or opt-in to the aggregated analysis. So for example, you want to see the overall trends, etc. 
then you are you you really do switch this out on to kind of use such data. But it comes down to kind of individual interventions that require safety class for a search. So I think we are already over time. I, I enjoy the conversation, but, uh, but I, I, I want to just kind of remind people that uh, I'm happy to continue. Just, just kind of as a. Well, you've given me a debrief and break for tea, and then use this if I want to document you. Yeah, sure. I'll see you.